cut through uh, all of the noise and distraction in our world, that as we enter into uh, your presence, Father, would you give us would you give us a sense that your spirit is with us and that we are that we are really hearing from you? Father, give us clarity, give us peace, uh, give us an ability to see uh, where you are. We love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm, so my little sister, and, and today we don't have our middle school classes, uh, but my little sister who teaches uh, the, the girls' middle school class, she used to work in New York. And in New York... Uh, it's a very different city, I, I, like in Manhattan, and she lived kind of the Lower East Side, and I remember visiting her one weekend because I promised her that I would go and see her. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not a big city kind of guy. I, I like the suburbs. I like uh, kind of finding parking and having a, you know, parking relatively close, uh, but when you're in the city, and, and not even just Denver urban, because we, we, we go down to Denver, and we, we have dinner, and it's, it's great and fun because I love it because there's actually parking, uh, but in New York, it's a little different, uh, especially in the big city. Uh, it, it's, it's hectic, it's wild, it's crazy. And I remember I flew into LaGuardia. We landed, my, my plane landed at like 10 o'clock. And so by the time I got my bags and by the time we got into the city, it was like midnight. And I remember my sister, uh, she, was, she was like, you know, meeting me and we, we, we got together. And I remember what she said. She goes, you want to eat? And I was like, it's midnight. She goes, yeah, the night just basically just started. And it was this crazy idea that we would eat so late at night. But she took me to this place uh, where, we, where, we, where we ate, and it was this kind of run-down hot dog place. It looked really bad. It looked like it wasn't, like, how, how could you call this, like, a cool place to eat? And the food was amazing. I mean, it was really sketchy. It was really good. But I remember it was really late at night. It was dark, and I, I, I had I'd never been into the city in, in that kind of way. You know, the, you see random people just walking the streets. It's a little scary. It's poorly lit. You go into a neighborhood that's, that doesn't even look that great. And then, and then we get to this place, and we have these amazing hot dogs. And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm glad, you know, you took me here. And it was, it was like one o'clock in the morning at that time. And she goes, no, I have, a, I have another surprise for you. I was like, what are you talking about? She goes, she goes, go into that phone booth or let's go to that phone booth. And I was like, what are you talking about? This is already, this is already crazy. I'm in this random place in New York City that I've never been before. It's dark. It's 1 a.m. There's random homeless people just walking the streets, you know, and it just, it's, it was kind of scary. It's kind of disorienti- uh, disorienting because I just landed and we go into this phone booth, and she dials a phone number in the phone booth. And, and as she dials it, she picks up the phone, and, and she just says some words. And I remember, the phone booth, we entered in this way, and then this wall just opens up. And it was this weirdest thing, because it was this, it was this waiter, this hostess. He opened this phone booth from the other side, and he's like, he's like welcome. And it was this bar. It was this speakeasy. And I just remember thinking, like, this is the weirdest experience I've ever been in my life. Because he opens the phone booth, and he's like, he's like, oh, we have room at the bar. And I remember we sat at the bar, and I was shocked because of how nice this bar was. And it was, it was wonderful. And my little sister and I, we had a good time to talk. And I was, like, gawking at the prices because, like, for, like, one drink, it was, like, $18. And I was like, this is crazy. But it was, it was really fascinating and interesting to see. Um, my little sister just take me through all of New York because she took me to these really weird places that I'm more of a tourist. I'm, I'm, I remember, I, I like the suburbs. I like going to places, you know, that have like five-star ratings on Yelp. And, and so going to these random places that she knew as a local, this trip, I purely just had to trust her. I just had to say, Jamie, you take me to where you want to take me. And after this first night where she took me to this really seedy and gross area of New York, I kind of learned, okay, you just got to go with the flow. Even if you walk into a restaurant and it looks like it's, it's a den of thieves, it's fine because it's going to be great because my little sister is the one who brought me here. She's not going to let me get murdered. She's not going to let me get mugged. I'm going to be fine because she, she knows her way around. She knows more than I do about the situation about where, where it is. And I remember even she wa- we walked past her old apartment and it's like super scary because it's really dark and like you have to go down these alleyways and down these random streets and, and I'm, I'm like getting lost, but she's not lost. And there came a point in that trip, I, I mean, I was exhausted and tired because every night we went to sleep around like 2, 3 a.m. in the morning and it was like, this is crazy. I want to go to bed at 9 o'clock. Um, what are you doing? But there came a point in the trip where really it was just, Jamie, wherever you want to go, Wherever you take me, I'm just going to go and we're going to have a great time because you know your way around. You know better than I do. 
I think, I think we really have to have a conversation. And, and again, um, the hard part about having a conversation when I'm on the pulpit is, is you can't really talk back to me, um, and I'm just the one giving a monologue and just, and just speaking to you. But I think what we've done when it comes to our relationship with the Lord is we've made it far too sterile. We've made it far too safe. We've made it far too suburban. And I'm not trying to condemn anyone for being, you know, for living in the suburbs. We all live in the suburbs. We, we, it's, it's nice. I like it. But I think we've, we've made our religion, our faith in God, very suburban. And what I mean by that is we don't take risks. We don't get uncomfortable. We don't do things outside of our experiences. It's very interesting when we talk about the fears of people and what people are most afraid of, ironically, uh, you know, the number one fear that most people have is public speaking. And I never understood that. I was like, what do you mean? Do I, why, why, why are people afraid of speaking in public? It's like the best thing in the world. And, um, you know, reading that is, is that people are afraid, afraid of speaking in public. People are afraid of um, death. And people are afraid of the unknown. And people are also afraid of change. I'm sure you've heard these things. I'm sure some of you are like, yeah, I hate all those things. Uh, all of the above. I hate I hate." public speaking, I hate death, I hate change, I hate the unknown. And I think it's in these fears that what we naturally do, what people naturally do, is when you have a fear, and you have the resources, and you have some money or some flexibility, you stay away from the things that you're afraid of. So if you're afraid of the unknown, if you're afraid of change, and you have the ability to stay away from change and the unknown, you, you do things so that you don't have to encounter that fear, that worry, that anxiety, that stress that we have. And what ends up happening is, is we begin to have these experiences that are very predictable, that are very pre-cut, prefabricated. Even church. Even when we gather in this place, in a sanctuary, in a place where there is music and there is someone leading us, there is someone who is speaking and they prepared a message for us, everything is very predictable. Everything is, is kind of on schedule. It's on time. You know, service starts at 9.45, so I'm going to get here there at 10, and it's just <laughs> like how things work. It, it's just, it's just kind of like clockwork. And that's just how we, how we treat Everything is that we know on a schedule and we, we have things where we understand what the next thing is going to happen. Like for many of you, even after church, even after we have our time of fellowship and food downstairs, you know I'm probably going to go here. I'm going to hang out with these people. I'm going to go home and rest. I'm going to do these things. And it's very predictable. It's very much the same things over and over and over again. And today I want to challenge you. And not that I'm telling you to get out of your comfort zone. But I think there's something that happens with our faith when we are so entrenched in our comfort zones that we begin to not purposely, and again, this is not to make you feel guilty. I hope in many of my sermons, my goal is never to make you feel guilty. It's really to have you think about your life, to think about where you stand in the midst of God. But what ends up happening when we live in this mode of comfort and this mode of, of persistency and this mode of, of prefabricated life, where everything is run by a schedule, what inevitably happens is we begin to deteriorate our trust in the Lord. We don't need to trust God. We have no need to trust him because we already know what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen in my next week. My schedule is set. This is what's going to happen in my next month. This is what's going to happen in my next year. And this is what's going to happen in my next decade. And so because I have my life preset and all planned out, what use do I have in trusting the Lord? And so we say we'll trust God and we'll trust him in everything. But when everything is already set and, and our mortgages even are set and we know this is where I'm going to be living for the next 30 years or the next even 10 years, everything is set in such a way where when we talk about trusting God, we have very little need for it. Some of us treat our, even our bank accounts as Again, not an intentional excuse not to trust the Lord. I'm, I'm not trying to get you to think that you're intentionally 
distrusting him. It's not about having a mistrust in God. But really what ends up happening is because our bank accounts get big, or, or there, there comes a, a, a certain you know, amount in our piggy banks that it becomes this size that we just naturally lose this passion and this desire and this need to trust God, that God will take care of it, that God will make a way, that God is the one who's going to do a work. Because what ends up happening is when we come to problems, when we come to adversity, we're like, you know what, I can just retire. I can just fall on my nest egg. I can just sell my house. I can just do these things, and I'll figure it out. One of the biggest dangers to trusting God, if you're sitting there and you want to learn what the first steps of trusting God is, is that we have to learn to stop saying, I'll deal with it. I'll fix it. If that's your natural response to every problem that comes in your life is, I'll fix it, you're naturally going to lose trust in the Lord. What ends up happening as Christians, what we need to learn, as believers and, and just as people that are trying to follow and learn more about God, is that when trouble comes, our first reaction shouldn't be, I can fix this. Our first response needs to be, must be, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need your help. Lord, you have to show up. Because if you don't show up, I don't know how I'm going to be able to live. I don't know how I'm going to be able to survive if you don't show up. And it's this kind of desperation that harbors and grows this faith that can move mountains. We talk a lot about faith, but what ends up happening is because when we come into contact with troubles and adversity that we say, I can fix it. I can deal with it. The voice of God becomes dull in our lives. Because when God says, what about me? I can fix it. I can help you. We say, no, Lord, I'm sure you have enough on your plate. You have, you know, all of creation to deal with. So with these problems in my life, I'll fix it. I'll deal with it. There's a, a, there's a leak in the roof. I can pay a roofer to fix it. You know, we're, we're running out of food in the, in the fridge. I can go to the store and I can, I can buy it. Lord, even, even, when, even when someone's sick, and, and, and we, need to go to the, we need to go to the doctor. The doctor will fix it. Medicine will fix it. We become so self-sufficient and, and so reactionary in knowing how to fix our problems that really when it comes to trusting God, he becomes an afterthought. I mean, even my kids, they've been sick for the past month and a half. And it, it hasn't been a big deal. And that's exactly what I've been saying. Is that, you know, they have a cough. They have an ear infection. We'll just go see the doctor. We'll just get some medicine, and they'll be good. Even for myself, I have to remind myself, how many times do I really go to the Lord? And do I, 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 I ask of him, do I plead of him, would you heal my children? Would you heal, would you heal my family so that we're no longer dealing with this illness? No, instead, I'm self-sufficient. My parents are doctors. My sister is a doctor. My families have all these doctors. And so what I've learned is, you know what? They can deal with it. We can fix it. It's not going to be, it's not that big of a deal. Today we're going to be reading from Psalm chapter 23. And even if you've never read the Bible before, if you've never even heard a sermon before, I'm sure you've heard this psalm before. It's one of the most famous passages in the Bible. So Psalm 23, I'm going to read it for us. And I'm going to read it for us a few times uh, throughout this sermon. But I, I want to start with just a, a reading straight through it. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A beautiful psalm written by King David. And we have to understand even the context of why David is writing this psalm. David is writing this psalm because his adversaries are coming after him to kill him. 
And we've talked in the past in, in previous sermons about how King Saul was out looking for David to kill David. And we even talked about how David spared the life of Saul. And he, and he basically had this opportunity to kill Saul a few times. And instead of killing him, he realized Saul is the anointed one of God. He, is, he is, has been chosen by God. So instead of killing him, I will spare him and not humiliate him, but just really show to all the people that I'm not going to touch a hair on his head. But the funny thing is, is Saul was continually trying to kill David. And then even after David is, is done running from Saul and, and David's on the throne, what ends up happening is David has a few children and one of the kids that he has is named Absalom. I don't know if you've never heard this guy's name, but Absalom is out to usurp his father's throne and he's out to kill his own dad. So there comes a point where David's on the run for his life, even from his own son. So David is writing the psalm, and we don't know when, but he's writing the psalm and he begins this, this song, really. This praise to God by saying, Lord, you are my shepherd, and I shall not want. And I love the beginning of this because it talks about a shepherd. And you know, the, the thing is, I have to explain to you what a shepherd really is in these times because we don't get shepherds. It's not like any one of you in this room, I mean, if you are, that's great. But I don't know if anyone here is a shepherd. If you are a shepherd, please, I want to talk to you and learn what it means to be a shepherd. Um, but we don't, we don't even understand that. For me, the closest thing to a shepherd I know is a farmer. I mean, that's all I know. And in Texas, where, I'm, uh, where I, I went to college and I went to seminary, uh, if you drive through kind of the, the western part of Texas, it's just desert. It's basically useless. But they have all these farms with all these cattle. And it's, it's not green grass. It's, just this, it's basically just mud. And it's just basically just cows as far as the eye can see. And you have a few, a few people, a few farmers that own all these cattle, and they just make sure that these cattle get fat so they, they can be led to the slaughter. And so when I read this idea of the Lord being my shepherd, at the end of the day, I kind of just default to this idea of a farmer. And I'm like, okay, God, you're my shepherd, and I'm just this, this cow that is, you know, being, being fed by you. I'm just, you know, a part of this industrial complex. And all, you know, all the other people in this church and all the other mega churches and all the other worship, places of worship, we're all, we're all just owned by you. And we're all, sad to say, we're all, we're all just here you know, being fed by you, being led by you uh, for your profit, for your benefit, so that your kingdom could grow. That's not really what David is talking about. Again, you know, seeing mega churches, even seeing our church, even seeing just churches around the world, um, David's not speaking from this idea of a shepherd shepherding over millions of cattle or millions of sheep. When David was a young man, before he was even chosen to be the king of Israel, you know, he was a young boy taking care of just a few number of sheep. It wasn't this huge group. It wasn't this large swath of sheep. It was just a, a, a very moderate, modest group of sheep. And what we know from kind of the explaining of what David and how David was a shepherd is, is his main job was to make sure the sheep didn't die. The sheep were fed. The sheep were protected. That he would fight off these lions and these bears. He would fight off robbers and, and thieves that would try to kill, steal, and destroy. And as a shepherd, what ends up happening is you begin to have a relationship with your sheep. And, and as the sheep are, are wandering too far off and they're grazing and they're having a good old time, there's this thing that shepherds do where they kind of have this song and they, they have this, this voice. They just call out to their sheep and their sheep know their voice. They know this song. And so no matter where they're going, they're you know, just grazing and they're just going all these crazy places. These sheep hear the voice of their shepherd and they come back to the shepherd and the shepherd leads them to the next place where they can graze. David is speaking to the Lord in this way. That the Lord is his shepherd. And that when he's tired and he's hungry, he knows God is going to lead him to a place where he's going to be refreshed. Where he's going to be renewed. He's going to be given energy. An ability to go about his days and survive. That God is the one who is leading him down this path. And the path is righteousness. And then we enter into this Second phase of the psalm in verse 4, it says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And I love this. I love this because it's this idea that as a shepherd, you, you want to get your sheep from point A to point B. You want to take them from this green pasture that they were just at, 
And you want to take them to where these still waters were, and you want to take them to the next location so they can get even better grass, they can get even better water, and they can just walk over to a safer place. But as you're walking through, there are sometimes these paths and these trails that are very dangerous and very sketchy and very, and very scary. And, and, and David kind of even, even describes it as, ba- as saying he's walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Essentially, he's not trying to create a, a pretty picture. It just is the shadow of death, this, this premonition that if I go down this road, I'm going to get hurt. It's not going to be good for me if I go down this road. But he says that he will not fear. And the reason he won't fear is because my shepherd is with me. My God is with me. My Lord is with me, and he's going to protect me. What kind of shepherd would he be if he took me down this path and he, and he, and he let me die? Or he let me even get injured or let me get hurt? That's a terrible shepherd. But my, my, my shepherd is a good shepherd. My God is a good God. So even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And so David is expressing his comfort, his desire to be close to the Lord, his desire that, that no matter where we're going, as long as you're with me, I trust you, and I know that you're going to take me to a good place, an even better place. So I'm going to follow you, even though my eyes see this is not looking good. And it's interesting because the next, the next little section in this it says, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And this comes at a, at a surprise to me, but really the, sh- the shepherd, he carries this big staff, um, this, this, this like large, large staff that he can use to walk, but um, it's, it's just really heavy stick and this rod that's more thinner, that's, that's thinner and it's just like, it's, you can you know, smack things with it, but you can smack things with both. And basically they use this rod and staff is that when those, those lions and when those bears or when a robber comes, that the shepherd can basically use this thing to hit people with or hit the bears with and, 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 and hit all the enemies that want to eat the sheep or steal the sheep, that basically the shepherd can use them as a weapon. And so, you know, think like a kung fu movie. You know, the shepherd is like ready to take some action and fight. And so David is saying, you know, you're my shepherd, and so you, your rod and staff, they comfort me. And it's this twofold thing. He knows the rod and staff can be used to deter these enemies. But interestingly enough, the rod and staff can also be used to hit the sheep. And, and the reason why you hit the sheep is because the sheep are stupid. And I don't know if you know about this, but sheep, and especially in Israel, there's a lot of these mountainous cliffs. And they're, I mean, it's, it's not huge mountains, but big enough that there are these plateaus. It basically just kind of falls off. And, and, and what the sheep would do is as they're walking, sheep are so dumb that they walk and they see something shiny or they see something they want to eat. And, and, they'll, and they'll grab it and then they'll fall off and they'll fall to their death. They'll just roll down the hill. So the shepherd's job is to make sure, okay, you're going to a place that's going to lead you to death. So they smack them. They hit them. The difference between the rod and the staff in conjunction to an enemy and in regards to the sheep is that the staff and the rod in terms of the enemy are meant to hurt and harm so that the enemies are away from the sheep. The difference is when the rod and the staff are used for the sheep, it's never meant to injure. It's never meant to harm. It's meant to wake you up. Hey, get out of this path that you're going because you're going to fall off this cliff and you're going to die. Whereas in regards to the enemy, it's the enemy. You need to get away. You need to get away because you cannot touch my sheep. A good shepherd is making sure that enemies are away and that sheep are in line. I will say the modern church has done a terrible job with this. Modern church, Christianity, has done a terrible job with this. Again, David is speaking to the Lord. He's speaking that you are my good shepherd. Um, But what we need to remember is is that as we are believers, we are to be imitators of Christ, imitators of the Lord. And this is, if you are a leader in this church, if you are a leader in your work, if you are a leader in your family, this is probably the easiest way I can explain how to be a leader, is to be a shepherd. And what that means is, is that you... You train the people that you are protecting that when you admonish them, when you critique them, when you criticize them, when you do these things, it's not meant to injure or harm them or hurt them. It's meant to keep them away from the edges that will lead to their death and their destruction and their injury. 
That if you're a leader, if you're someone that considers yourself a leader, if you want to be like the Lord and you want to do it the way he does it, he uses his rod and his staff to make sure that his people are not straying off to a place where they're going to get harmed. But he uses his rod and staff to discipline them. To say, hey, we don't do that here. Hey, be careful. You're going too close to the edge. And we begin to make rules and we, we need to gather them in. But also, as a leader, what you need to use is your rod and your staff to keep enemies away. To keep those who mean the sheep harm. To protect them. To guide them. And lead them into a place of safety. And this, is, this goes back to the idea of the valley of the shadow of death that I, I really want to get to you today. Walking down the valley of the shadow of death is not a good idea. It's not. Again, if you're a sheep and you see green pastures on your left and you see, and you see a valley of shadow and death, is it smart if you're the sheep? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. If, you, if, you're, if you're a sheep, and if you're just, even if you are you, would you be like, hey, that valley looks great. I'm going to go down there. No, it's ridiculous. It, it, it's illogical. But here's the thing. Imagine you have a shepherd. You have someone who knows. Who knows a lot more than you do. And again, this isn't to call you stupid like these sheep. They're stupid. You're not stupid. You have your eyes and your, your ability to see. But imagine the shepherd has a, has a better view. Imagine the shepherd's in a helicopter, and he can see, and he sees in the green pasture, there's a pack of wolves. In the pasture, there are thieves and robbers ready to jump you, ready to steal you, ready to kill you. And in this valley of the shadow of death, it leads to a different pasture. It leads to a different road to a place of safety. And I think this is what happens far too often in the Christian life, and not even just the Christian life, just in people's lives, is that everything is done to make sure that I have my green pasture and I have my still water, and if you ever try to take that away from me, you are my enemy. Even when, even when it's the church, even when it's the Bible that's saying, no, 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 wait, 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 hold on. Let's go down this, this valley because the Lord is with us. He is guiding us down this very turbulent and rough and dangerous and difficult time because this is the way that he wants us to go because it's going to lead us to an even better place, a safer place. This is where I believe a lot of people say, you know what? Too scary. Too much change. Too much of the unknown. I'm not going down that path. I'm going to stay where I know. And you know what? Those waters were still these, this grass is green, so y'all can go down that path, and man, wish you the best, but I'm going to stay here. The thing about following the Lord is for your prosperity. I'm not here to teach you the prosperity gospel. I'm not here to teach you that God, God just wants to, you to know, buy a bigger house, and he wants to buy, you to buy a bigger boat. He wants you to have, you know, all these things, a bigger family, and make, make all these things. That's not what I'm talking about. God wants you to prosper, but the way he wants you to prosper is by staying right by his side. And that even when God says, all right, we're going to go down this path of the valley of the shadow of death. That instead of saying, no, I want prosperity, I'm going to stay here in the green grass and the still waters, that our understanding of how to gain prosperity is by saying, Lord, I'll go wherever you go. Even if it seems dangerous. Even if it's risky. Even if it's at personal loss. I will go where you call me to go. What I find very interesting, and I'm kind of unfair, let me tell you. <laughs> it's really unfair. If you choose to say, Lord, I will follow you to the, to the valley of the shadow of death, what ends up happening... <laughs> You get disciplined even more. And it seems so unfair. It's like all, all your friends, everyone's staying back in the, in the, with the, in the green pastures and, and the still waters, and you're like, no, Lord, I want to just stay with you. And if you're going down to the valley of the shadow of death, I want to go with you. What's really unfair is like the Lord's like, that's great, come on. And you start going to the valley of the shadow of death, and you get smacked in the face. God, I'm following you. I'm doing what you want me to do. Why are you hitting me? It's because if you keep going that way, you're going to die. All right, so you keep, you keep going get smacked in this face. Lord, why are you being so harsh on me? Why are you being so difficult? Because we wanted to make a left turn, not a right turn. I, I, I need you to understand that you need to be exact and precise in the way you follow me. Following the Lord comes at a cost. It's difficult. It's uncomfortable. It's not easy. 
But following him is the best. What I love about this passage is that the way it ends for me is the gospel. But it says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What, what happens after we walk through the valley of the shadow of death and we fear no evil because we're with the Lord and as we're being comforted by the rod, and again, it's so funny, we're being comforted by the staff and the rod, you know, just being hit all the time, because we know we're safe. We know when, when the Lord is saying you're doing it wrong, you're like, okay, I, I'm, I'm, you're happy. You're happy because someone is putting you back into line. It comforts you, but what he leads you into is no longer this green grass, this pasture of still water. It's, it's not like this. It's a table that's been set for you. It's this banquet. It's this feast. And guess what? It's in the presence of your enemies. Again, this is, this is where it seems so weird as a believer or as a Christian, as a follower of Christ. You would think, okay, I'm going to follow Jesus and I'm going to follow him to the best of my ability, doing everything that he wants of me, and I'm going to get prosperity. I'm going to experience prosperity for the rest of my life. I'm going to get what I want. And then we get there, and it's a table. It's been set for us. It's a blessing beyond blessings. But there's an interesting twist. It's in the presence of your enemies. These same people that want to kill you, they want to destroy you, they want to hurt you. God has now set a spread in the midst of your enemies. I think of Jesus when I read Psalm 23. I think of Jesus and his ministry and his life. I think of how the critique he got from the Pharisees. And, and really, the Pharisees were just trying to keep the status quo. They were, they were just trying to make sure that not a lot of change was going to come and happen to their religion and their temple. Jesus came on the scene, and he, and he followed God perfectly. He followed, he followed the Father in the perfect way that as humans we are supposed to follow the Father. And what we see time and time again is Jesus purposely takes the time to get out of his comfort zone and stop eating with the people that just praise him all the time, that just worship him all the time, and he eats with the sinners. He eats with the prostitutes. He eats with the tax collectors. He eats with the homeless. He eats with the drug addicts. He eats with all the people who are on the fringes of the society. And he eats with them, and he makes friends of these people. He loves on them. He cares for them. And God, again, continues to lead Jesus down these paths of the valley of the shadow of death to a point where Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane moments before he's arrested. And he's even asking the Lord, he's like, take this cup away from me. Come on, Lord, stop leading me down these paths to the valley of the shadow of death. Give me some moments where I can go to the green pastures. Take this cup away from me if it's your will. And thankfully, Jesus didn't choose the green pastures, but he willingly chose the valley of the shadow of death. He willingly chose to take the cup. And what ends up happening is so, is so key. Is as he's going down this valley of the shadow of death, he's beaten, he's bruised, he's murdered. But because he followed the Lord, he followed his father, he was raised from the dead. The valley of the shadow of death will always lead to resurrection because the Lord is with us. And it's because he was obedient, it's because of his sacrifice that we can now share in his example. We can now do the same that Jesus has done. I'm sick of religion. I'm sick of it. More and more, as I contemplate just even what we're doing here, I'm so sick of the facade, and I'm so sick of, I, I, again, just let me rant for a second. I'm so sick of all of the structure sometimes. I'm so sick of just all the, all the different things and all the barriers that we put on what it means to even be a church. I, I, there are many times I'm just so frustrated by it because at the end of the day, I, it's not that I don't like it. It just feels like, we value comfort more than really following the Lord. More than it being about being excited 
about following the Lord down the valley of the shadow of death. We kind of create our groups to stay in green pastures. And yeah, and maybe even the Lord isn't even in our small group anymore. Maybe the Lord isn't even in my Bible study. Even, even the, maybe the Lord isn't even in our Sunday service. But it's okay because the, the music's good. The message is good. So, you know, even if the Lord's not here, even if I don't experience him, it was, it was, a, it was a good day. And I feel, I feel good about myself. I feel good because I went to church. You know, I, I gave some money. And, and so, you know, my, my, my conscience is clean. I'm sick of it. Because I would rather follow God down the valley of the shadow of death, knowing that he's beside me, knowing he's with me, knowing that he's guiding and leading me more than I want to be comfortable. Because it's those moments that our faith grows because when it's not so structured and it's not so safe, we begin to have this need to trust him. Because it's risky and it's dangerous. This past week, I, I, I've had a lot of meetings, but I met, even met with some of the pastors and just talking about the frustrations that we've had. And it's this, this other pastor in our denomination. And we met and we just started discussing. And, and it, was, it was really interesting just what we were sharing to one another. And a lot of it is, is that, man, sometimes we just get so comfortable that really when it comes to doing what God wants us to do, and I'm not talking just about missions. I'm not talking about you have to travel across the world to do a good work. I'm talking about even here in our city, that sometimes when we talk about evangelizing or just opening up our homes, there's a lot of times that we do not want to walk down that valley of the shadow of death. I will not open up my home. I will not send my kids to a bad school. I will not go into the parts of, of, of the bad parts, the poor parts, because I need to keep myself safe. sick of it and again i'm not here to make you feel guilty i'm just desiring some time with the lord and you know what i think intimacy with the lord comes at a risk the risk is you have to let go of your green pastures the risk is you have to let go of the still waters the funny thing is the lord is the one who can choose to lead you to green pastures and the still waters but the lord also can choose to lead you down the path to the valley of the shadow of death. The Lord is also going to lead you to a table set before you and your enemies. The question is, is what do you value? Do you value the comfort or do you value being with your shepherd? Do you know his voice? Do you know his words? Do you know his rules? Do you know the direction he's taking you? Many of us don't even want to hear what God has to say to us. Many of us don't want to listen and obey, especially when it's uncomfortable. This sermon is titled, Walking in the Shadows. I think we've, we've listened to a lie from the devil. And I think that the lie from the devil is a good one. I mean, he's, the devil is very good at, at telling you lies. I think the devil is telling you, the Lord is only going to lead you into light. It's a good lie. It's one that kind of sticks. The Lord is only going to lead you into the light. It's a good one. I think I could start a church just with that, you know? God is going to bring you just light. It's going to be great. The reason why I, I, I wanted to speak about this with you today is when we look at Jesus, Jesus was not led into the light. Jesus was led into the darkness to be a light, to be the light. You see, when we walk down the valley of the shadow of death, it's not because it's light. It's because our shepherd is light. It's because our Lord is light. And so we do not fear because God is with us and God is next to us. God is leading us. Too many of us look at our context and make idols of our context when really our goal should be just to follow the Lord wholeheartedly. This is what I want church to be. I don't want church to be this thing where you just feel comfortable all the time, where you feel good all the time. And I pray and I hope that as I bring you the word each and every week, that you feel at least at one moment a little uncomfortable certain weeks. That you would feel a little uncomfortable with the, the fact that sin exists and God wants to deal with it and God wants to do a good work in you. But what I hope and I pray, I hope and I pray that you would value time with the Lord over all else. Let's pray.
Father, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for your word. I thank you for Psalm 23. I thank you for the words of David, that even as he's running away from people who want to kill him, that he knows you are his shepherd, and you will lead him into green pastures and by still waters, that you will lead him through the valley of the shadow shadow of death. Lord, you will lead him to a, a table that is set for him and his enemies. Father, I pray that you would help us to be like Christ, that you would help us to be willing to walk into the valley of shadow of death. You would help us walk into the darkness and to be a light. That you would help us to shine your love in the places that the world has already given up on. Would you be with our church? Help our church to be a missional one. To be one in willing that we would be desiring, not comfort, but we would be desiring your presence. We would be desiring you. Father, would you speak to us? Would you reveal yourself to us? And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.